Right, this is chapter 21, part A on the respiratory system. So in this section, we'll focus more on respiratory system anatomy, and in part B, we'll look at respiratory system physiology. Okay, so it's the major functions of the respiratory system basically is to supply the body cells with oxygen so that they can undergo cellular respiration and make ATP energy. Um, and also it's going to dispose of carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of that cellular metabolism, cellular respiration. So the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system are closely linked, as we discussed before um, in the heart chapter. So that pulmonary circuit, the heart pumps blood to the lungs to receive oxygen and then returns to the heart to deliver that oxygen to the tissue cells. Um, it also has some functions in olfaction, which is your sense of smell and speech. So respiration involves four major processes. So you have to have uh, pulmonary ventilation, which is just breathing, so movement of air in and out of the lungs. Um, external respiration, which would be the gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and the blood. So this is where the blood travels to the lungs to pick up oxygen and dump CO2. Okay, so external as in um, outside the body. So oxygen is coming from outside the body and we're expelling carbon dioxide outside the body when we exhale. Um, so these two uh, processes are going to fall under the um, role of the respiratory system. Right? So we said the respiratory system was closely linked to the cardiovascular system. So the uh, circulatory system functions include transport um, of these gases in the blood. So as the heart pumps the blood, it's going to transport all these gases throughout the body. Um, and then internal respiration. So this would be gas exchange um, between the blood vessels and the tissue. So oxygen is going to go from the blood to the tissue cells. Um, carbon dioxide is going to go from the tissue cells into the blood. So some functional anatomy of the respiratory system. So we can break it up into two major regions. So the upper respiratory tract includes the nose and nasal cavity, um, the paranasal sinuses, and the pharynx or the throat. The lower respiratory system includes things like the larynx, um, the trachea, bronchi, and of course the lungs and the alveoli air sacs. Okay, so looking at the nose and the paranasal sinuses first. So the nose is actually the only external portion of the respiratory system that we can see. Um, so some functions of the nose and nasal cavity include um, just providing that airway for respiration. So we're going to inhale air through the nose. Um, so then as the air enters the nose and the nasal cavity, it's going to uh, be moistened and warmed. Right? So we add a little bit of humidity to it so it's not so dry to dry out those mucous membranes. Uh, we're also going to filter and clean any dust, debris, or particles from that inspired air. So we don't want that to get down into the lungs. Um, some non-respiratory functions of the nose and uh, paranasal sinuses include resonating, resonating chamber for speech. Uh, so the sound waves produced by our voice box are going to kind of bounce around inside this nasal cavity and sinuses. Um, so that's why when you have a stuffed up nose, it changes the way that your voice sounds. Um, and then houses olfactory receptors. So your sense of smell, your uh, smell receptors um, are going to be found um, here near the roof of the nasal cavity um, through this uh, cribiform plate. Okay. Um, so two regions, the external nose and the nasal cavity. Okay. So the nasal vestibule is going to be um, the region just superior to the nostril. So when we first enter the nasal cavity, so this is going to be lined with vibrissae, um, which are just hairs. So the nasal hairs to help filter any coarse particles, things like dust or pollen or whatever, um, from that inspired air. Um, so the rest of the nasal cavity is going to be lined with those mucous membranes. So the olfactory mucosa lining this superior region. Um, the nasal cavity that's going to contain the olfactory epithelium um, and those olfactory nerves. So um, scent particles, odor particles will make contact with these olfactory nerves and the information will travel to the brain through 
um, that olfactory nerve. Um, and then the respiratory mucosa. So this is going to be composed of a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so remember, pseudostratified means that it looks like it's more than one layer, but it's really only one layer. Ciliated meaning it has those little hairs on the ends of the cell that's going to help sweep mucus and things um, down the respiratory tract. Okay. Um, so this epithelia, this respiratory mucosa, contains goblet cells, which are just mucus-producing cells. Right. So remember, um, from Anatomy 1, all of our open body cavities are going to be lined by these mucous membranes. Right. So we want to keep these cavities moist, um, and the mucus secretions is going to help trap any uh, potential pathogens or dust and things that come inside the body. So within the nasal cavity, again, we have these uh, mucus glands um, and mucus cells. Um, so serous cells are going to secrete a more watery fluid that contains some specific enzymes. Um, so things like lysozyme and defensins. Um, so these are going to help prevent against um, infections from taking hold in the nasal cavity and the respiratory system. So one of the easiest ways for bacteria and viruses and things to get inside the body is through um, our nose. So we would inhale um, all of these particles. So we have kind of a, a barrier kind of at the door to catch anything that may try to get in. Okay? Uh, anything that does get trapped in that mucus would then be swept um, towards the throat or down into the stomach by those cilia on the mucosa. Um, and also we said that the um, air is going to be kind of warmed and um, humidified a bit so we don't dry out the mucosa. So all the capillaries and blood vessels in that nasal cavity are going to help to warm that air as it enters the nasal cavity. Um, and then, of course, we have all those sensory nerve endings um, that can cause sneezing. So if something large enough enters the nasal cavity to trigger those nerves, right, that means it's something that we would not want to make it further into the respiratory tract. So sneezing is a reflex to help force those particles out of the nasal cavity. So the nasal conchae are um, kind of these projections or these ridges in the wall of the nasal cavity. Okay, so we have a superior, uh, middle, and inferior. Um, the nasal meatus would just be the grooves in between these conchae. Okay. Um, so the shape of these nasal conchae is just going to help to increase our surface area, our mucosal surface area, and it's also going to increase the air turbulence. So instead of the air kind of taking a straight line path from the nostril down into um, the throat and the lungs, um, it's going to kind of um, undergo some turbulence and kind of spin around a bit um, before it reaches the throat. So this is going to help to warm the air and moisten it before it goes into those deeper structures. So the paranasal sinuses are going to form a ring around the nasal cavity. So there's several um, sinuses located in the respiratory system. So you have your frontal sinus, uh, a sphenoid sinus, ethmoid, uh, and the maxillary. So you don't need to know specifically the names of the sinuses, just kind of know their general function. So they're going to help to lighten the skull. Right? So if our skull was solid bone through and through, it would be very heavy. So we have a lot of these uh, open spaces, these sinuses, to help lighten the weight of the skull. Um, they're also going to secrete mucus. So if you've ever had a cold or a sinus infection, right, you're aware of that. So when um, they secrete excess mucus, that's when you would get the kind of sinus pressure and sinus pressure headaches. Um, and then also they're just going to add to that function of warming and moistening the air as it's inhaled. So the pharynx is just a technical term for the throat. So it's just a muscular tube that's going to run from around the base of the skull to um, 
C6 vertebrae. So it's basically going to connect the nasal cavity to the mouth and to the windpipe and the uh, esophagus. Right? Like we said, it's composed of skeletal muscles, so meaning you have conscious control over your throat muscles. Right? So when we swallow, right, you consciously are using those muscles to propel your food down the throat. Okay. Um, so three regions of the pharynx include the nasopharynx. Um, so this would be kind of the back of the nasal cavity where it goes to like the top, the back of your throat. Um, the oropharynx is going to be connected to the oral cavity. Right? So the back of your throat from your mouth. And the laryngeopharynx is going to be below that near the larynx. Okay, so looking at the nasopharynx, we said it was basically just the air passageway from that nasal cavity. Okay? Um, so it's still going to contain that pseudostratified um, epithelium, um, and it's going to include things like the soft palate and the uh, uvula. Okay? Um, so when we swallow, the uh, uvula is going to kind of contract upward and close off the opening to that nasopharynx. Um, the tonsils are also located in this region, so your pharyngeal tonsils or the adenoids um, are located in the posterior wall. Um, and then the pharyngeotympanic tubes or your ear um, canal tubes are going to drain and equalize pressure in your middle ear uh, and then open into those lateral walls of the pharynx. So the oral pharynx is going to be a passageway for both food and air. So food um, coming through the mouth as well as air that we inhale. So it's going to run from um, the soft palate to the epiglottis, which is this flap right here. Um, so it consists more of a stratified squamous epithelium, more like the lining of the mouth. Um, it's also going to contain the palatine tonsils, um, as well as the lingual tonsil. So lingual just means tongue. So we have some tonsils that we talked about in the lymphatic system chapter. Um, Finally, the laryngeopharynx is also going to be a passageway for food and air. Right? So it's just um, posterior to the epiglottis and extends to the larynx, right? um, where then it will continue um, to the esophagus. Right? Um, and it's also lined with that stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so continuing down into the respiratory system, our lower respiratory structures consist of the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. So we can break our lower respiratory tract into two zones. So the respiratory zone would be the sites of actual gas exchange. So this is where that respiration, um, that external respiration is going to occur. Um, so it's going to consist of some microscopic, very tiny structures, um, such as the respiratory bronchioles, um, alveolar ducts, and the alveoli air sacs. Um, the second zone is just the conducting zone. So this is just going to be the passageway for the air to reach the lungs in the respiratory zone. Um, so it'll include pretty much every other respiratory structure. So the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, um, the trachea, the bronchi. Um, so functions of the conducting zone, like I said, just to carry the air to the respiratory zone. And like we discussed, um, to clean, warm, and humidify the air before it reaches these deeper structures. Okay, so looking at the larynx, um, so which is also going to contain the voice box. Right? Um, so it attaches to the hyoid bone. Right? So remember from Anatomy 1 when we looked at all the bones, the hyoid bone was special in that um, it's not actually articulated to any other bone in the body. Right? Um, but it's going to open from the laryngeopharynx and then continue um, with the trachea. Um, so three general functions of the larynx is to provide an airway, of course, so air is going to pass through here. Um, and this is going to be the divergent point for food and air. So the epiglottis um, is going to kind of reroute the air and food to their proper channel. So if we're swallowing food, then the epiglottis will close. 
right? and the food will continue through the esophagus. If we are inhaling air, then the epiglottis will remain open so air can go through the trachea. Um, and then, of course, the voice production is going to uh, be derived from the larynx. So your vocal cords or vocal folds are located um, in this structure. Okay. Um, so like we mentioned, the epiglottis um, is basically going to reroute your food and air into the proper channel. So we don't have food going into the respiratory tract, the trachea, um, and we don't have air going down into the esophagus and the stomach. Um, so it's composed of an elastic cartilage, so meaning it's very kind of springy um, and will uh, kind of bounce and recoil. Um, and it's just going to cover the opening of the larynx um, during swallowing. Okay. Um, and there are also some taste bud containing mucosa. So you can actually see the epiglottis if you um, look way back in uh, the back of your throat. So that little flap you see sticking out behind your tongue um, is the epiglottis. So we said another function of the larynx was voice production. So the vocal folds or vocal ligaments um, or vocal cords, whatever you want to call them, um, are going to be found in the larynx. Um, so these are going to contain some elastic fibers that allow the vocal cords to kind of vibrate and um, recoil. Um, and they appear white just because they lack blood vessels. So being a um, more connective tissue, it's going to have low blood supply. Um, so the glottis is just the opening between the vocal folds, so the whole, um, so then epiglottis, right, would be above that opening. Um, so to produce sound or voice production, these folds or these ligaments will vibrate as the air rushes up from the lungs past them. Like I said, voice production is essentially just air vibrating the vocal cords. So when we look at things like speech, um, it's essentially kind of an intermittent release of that air during an opening and closing of the glottis. So the pitch of someone's voice will be determined by the length and the tension of their vocal cords. So um, say a large man that would have larger um, vocal cords uh, would have a deeper pitched voice as opposed to someone small or maybe a child that has a higher pitched voice because they have smaller um, vocal cords. So the loudness of someone's voice just depends upon the force of the air. So the more force you put behind the air during speech, the louder that sound will be and vice versa. Um, and then we talked about how some of the chambers um, in the nasal cavity, um, the oral cavity, pharynx, all of those are going to help resonate or amplify the sound quality. So again, if you have a stopped up nose, you have a sinus infection, right, it changes the way that your voice sounds because we've lost that resonation. Right? Those sound waves don't have as much open space to kind of bounce around or as much air to travel through. Um, so then we can shape these sounds into language by using muscles of our throat, tongue, soft palate, and lips. Okay, so continuing on to the trachea or the windpipe. So it's going to extend from your larynx right, into the mediastinum. Um, and then from there it divides into two of the main bronchi. So the trachea itself is only about four inches long, um, but it's very flexible, composed of um, connective tissues and cartilage. So looking at the tissues that make up the trachea, it's composed of three different layers. So the mucosa would be the, um, the outer or the, uh, the inner layer that's going to align the um, inside of the trachea. Right? So it's going to be composed of that pseudostratified ciliated um, columnar epithelium with the mucus producing goblet cells. Right? So again, so if we have all the mucus in here, so dust and debris and things, particles get trapped in the mucus, these little cilia hairs are going to sweep that mucus up and out of the respiratory system. Okay? Um, the submucosa is um, connective tissue with some of those seromucous glands um, and it's going to be supported by um, that c-shaped cartilage rings um, and then finally the outermost layer is the adventitia 
So the adventitia is just the um, kind of covering, lining layer um, made up of connective tissues. Um, so some specific parts of the trachea, the trachealis is um, this small little band of muscle right here. Um, so this smooth muscle is going to help connect the posterior parts of these cartilage rings. Right? Um, so when we cough, um, this muscle contracts to help expel that mucus and things um, that are in the respiratory tract. Um, and again, so the cartilage in the trachea is a C-shaped cartilage. So um, the reason why it's not a complete circular cartilage is because we have the esophagus here behind it. So the esophagus is going to have to be able to expand when we swallow food and things. Um, so we don't want um, too much rigidity at this layer next to the esophagus. Um, another special feature of the trachea is the carina. Um, so it's not labeled here, but it's this last tracheal cartilage right, right here um, that's a little bit expanded and bigger than the previous tracheal rings. Um, so this will be kind of the last ring of tracheal cartilage before it branches off into the two main bronchi, into the left and right bronchi. Um, so the mucosa within this ring, this cartilage ring, this carina, is going to be um, highly sensitive. So if anything um, besides air does reach that far down to the trachea, um, it'll trigger kind of a violent coughing fit. Um, so that'll be kind of our last ditch attempt to keep whatever it is from getting into the lungs and these deeper structures. Um, so homeostatic imbalance with the respiratory system. Um, so smoking um, can actually inhibit and destroy the cilia that line the respiratory tract. So without these cilia and their uh, sweeping activity, the only way to kind of um, prevent mucus from accumulating and building up in the lungs is coughing. So this is the reason why smokers have that stereotypical smoker's cough. Okay. Um, so also when someone stops smoking, um, they actually would have a worse cough than they had before when they were smoking. Um, so this is due to once the person stops smoking, their cilia start to regrow and kind of come back online right, and start functioning again. So the cilia are going to start working overtime to clean out all of that um, smoke and mucus and all that nastiness from the respiratory tract. But generally after a few days, a couple weeks, they'll start to breathe better and feel better. Um, but generally it gets worse before it gets better. So continuing on to the bronchi and its subdivisions. So once we uh, reach the end of the trachea, it's going to branch into the left and right uh, main bronchi. Um, so from there, it's going to branch off more and more and uh, become referred to as what's called the bronchial tree. So from the tips of the bronchial tree, um, we'll have kind of the transition between our conducting zone where air is just traveling. Uh, and then it's going to lead into finally the respiratory zone structures, the actual sites of gas exchange, those air sacs in the alveoli in the lungs. So looking at our conducting zone structures, so we said the trachea is going to split and divide to form the right primary bronchi and the left main primary bronchi. Um, so if you notice, the right main bronchus is a little bit wider and a bit more vertical than the left. So this one, it goes kind of straight down a bit more where this one has a more, a little bit of an angle. Um, so the, uh, the right bronchus is actually more prone to um, having foreign objects and things lodged in it. So if something does make it down into the trachea past that carina cartilage, um, it's more than likely going to go straight down into the right lung as opposed to um, the left. Okay. Um, so then each bronchus is going to enter the lung at the uh, hilum, which is kind of this medial portion where the trachea and the blood vessels and nerves are going to enter. Um, so then from there, each main bronchi is going to um, branch and split into the secondary or lobar bronchi. So the um, 
the right bronchus is going to divide into three uh, because we have three lobes. So we have one secondary bronchi for each lobe. The left only has two lobes, so it has um, two lobar or secondary bronchi. So again, each secondary bronchus um, is going to serve one lobe. So our right lung has three lobes, the left lung only has two. Right. So then from there, we're going to continue to divide even further and get smaller and smaller. So these lobar secondary bronchi are going to branch into the segmental or tertiary bronchi. Right. Um, so then from there, they're just going to continue to divide repeatedly and get smaller and smaller until they uh, become what are called bronchioles. So bronchioles are just like really tiny bronchi. So Think back to the blood vessels where we had the arterioles, which were the really small arteries. So the bronchioles are the really small bronchi. Um, so these are going to lead into the terminal bronchioles. So these are the smallest of all the branches, and it's also going to be kind of the end of the road for um, our conducting zone. So from here, the, um, the air is going to lead into these alveolar um, ducts and air sacs. So some structures within this conducting zone. So as we go from the bronchi to the bronchial, some um, physical structural changes are going to occur. So support structures changes, meaning that the um, cartilage rings are going to become more plate-like. Right? Um, and elastic fibers are eventually going to replace the cartilage altogether. So we don't want too much constriction on um, these bronchioles. Right? Um, so epithelia is also going to change. So we're going to go from that pseudostratified columnar to just a regular cuboidal. Right? Um, and there the cilia and goblet cells will become more sparse. So we don't want a lot of mucus production in those respiratory zones. Right? Um, and then finally the amount of smooth muscle is going to increase. So as we undergo all of those um, branching and divisions, right, we're making more um, bronchioles, so we're increasing the surface area. So as a result, the amount of smooth muscle is going to increase. Um, so this allows the bronchioles to uh, kind of control how much air is entering into those air sacs. So they can either constrict or dilate a little bit, just like what we saw with the blood vessels. So now we've entered into our respiratory zone structure. So this is where the actual physiology is happening. So where um, gas exchange is going to occur. Right? So respiratory zone begins where um, the terminal bronchioles feed into the respiratory bronchioles. Right? Um, and they're going to lead from the alveolar ducts to the alveolar sacs. Right? Um, so these alveolar sacs are kind of like grape clusters um, that are going to contain clusters of alveoli. So one, um, say one grape on the cluster is one alveoli. Um, so these are the actual sites of gas exchange. Right? Um, and there, again, you can see the smooth muscle. Right? So if we need to constrict the bronchiole and restrict the airflow, the smooth muscle would con uh, contract. Right, and vice versa, we can dilate to allow more airflow by relaxing this smooth muscle. So the respiratory membrane is going to be that blood air barrier that's going to be composed of the alveolar walls and the capillary walls that are fused together. So we want um, a rapid diffusion of the gases across the membrane. Right? So we have a very thin almost single um, layer of tissue. Right? So pretty much the wall of the capillary and the air sacs are fused together, kind of making one, um, one respiratory membrane, one tissue. So that way the gases can easily and rapidly cross this tissue. So if we had multiple layers of cells here, it would take more time, more energy for those gases to travel all the way through that thicker tissue. So we want a very thin tissue. Yeah. Um, so alveolar walls consist of your single layer of squamous epithelia. 
So just these single layer of kind of flat cells. So these are your type one, right? So just basic um, kind of epithelial cells. And then you can see kind of where they're surrounded by the capillaries um, and where they make contact with those blood vessels. Um, and then scattered throughout, you have some type 2 alveolar cells. So these are the green ones, just kind of sporadically placed throughout the air sacs. Um, so these are going to secrete surfactant, um, which is just going to help reduce surface tension of the fluid in the lungs, which we'll talk more about surfactant in the next section. Um, and they're also going to secrete some antimicrobial proteins. So again, one of the easiest ways for pathogens to get into the body is the respiratory system. So if, say, some bacteria or a virus doesn't get caught by um, the higher or the conducting zone structures or the mucus, um, and it does make it into the lungs, we do have um, some immune cells to help kind of prevent further spread or prevent those bacteria or viruses from getting into the bloodstream. Um, some other features of the alveoli, so they're surrounded by some elastic fibers and pulmonary capillaries. So this allows them to be able to expand and recoil when we inhale. Right? We fill these alveoli with air, they're going to stretch a little bit. Um, but when we exhale, we want them to kind of snap back to their original size. Right? Um, and of course, it has a very um, vascular um, has very vascular blood supply, so these are completely going to be kind of covered and enmeshed with these capillaries. Okay. Um, and then there's some alveolar pores. They're not labeled. You kind of see here these little specks inside the air sacs. Um, so this is just to kind of equalize the air pressure throughout the alveolar sacs and the lungs um, and also provide an alternate route in case of a blockage. So if one air sac has a blockage, then the air still has another passageway, another direction it can go to fill an empty air sac. Um, and like I said, it's also going to contain some of those macrophages, those immune cells, to help keep these alveoli sterile so we don't get any um, respiratory infections. Okay, so looking at some just gross general anatomy of the lung. So we know the lungs occupy almost all the thoracic cavity, um, except for that mediastinum and the pericardial cavity. So the apex of the lungs would be um, the tip, so the top point. Right? So like an apex um, is just like the peak of something, so the apex of a mountain. Right? So the apex of the lungs is just this top peak um, and the base would be this inferior surface that's going to rest upon the diaphragm. Um, and again the hilum found on that uh, mediastinal or that medial surface um, will be the site for your nerves, blood vessels, and uh, bronchi to enter and exit the lungs. So we said before that the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two. So it's because the left lung is slightly smaller than the right lung due to um, the position of the heart. So remember the heart is slightly to the left of the midline. Um, so the left lung is going to contain this cardiac notch. So kind of just a little notch for the heart to rest and fit into the chest cavity. Um, so the lobes of the left lung, so you have the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. So these are going to be separated by this oblique fissure. Right? So remember, a fissure is just kind of a deep groove. Um, it's going to separate something. So the oblique fissure separates our superior and inferior left lung lobes. Um, so the right lung, being a bit larger, is going to have three lobes. Right? So we have a superior lobe a middle lobe and an inferior lobe. So these are separated by um, the oblique fissure and a horizontal fissure. So remember from anatomy one that organs are lined with serous membranes. So the serous membrane of the lungs um, are called the pleurae. Right? So it's that thin double layer serosal membrane um, that's going to divide the thoracic cavity into those two um, pleural or lung compartments and that mediastinum. So, so the parietal pleura is going to um, line the thoracic cavity wall. 
Okay. Um, so remember, parietal lines the wall cavity, visceral lines the actual organ. So the visceral pleura is going to um, line the actual surface of the lungs. Okay. So remember, visceral means um, like organ or gut. So like if you have a visceral reaction to something, you have a gut reaction. Or like in movies, if someone has been eviscerated, like their guts are spilling out. So viscera, pleura, or visceral membranes always line the actual organ itself. Parietal is going to line the cavity wall. Right, so then remember, we have a small space between these two layers, the two membranes, um, that's going to be filled with a serous fluid, right, or in this case called pleural fluid. Um, but the purpose of that fluid is just to provide lubrication and um, resist kind of friction. So when the lungs expand, we don't want them to rub up against the rough um, chest cavity wall or the ribs. So this is just showing a transverse section view of the pleural cavity. So we have in that parietal pleura kind of lining the wall of the cavity and the visceral pleura lining the surface of the lung. So then in between those two, we have this thin little slit-like cavity that's going to be filled with that serous fluid. Okay, so just to summarize now all of the respiratory structures that we've looked at. So starting with the nose, right? So um, nasal cavity and the nose are going to function to produce mucus, filter, warm, moisten the air, um, as well as a resonance chamber for speech and house the receptors for olfaction. Uh, paranasal sinuses are going to help to lighten the skull and also contribute to that warming, moistening, and filtering of the incoming air. Um, the pharynx is the throat, so it's going to be basically just a passageway for air and food. Um, and how's the tonsils um, that are part of that lymphatic system um, and the immune system. Right. The larynx is going to contain the voice box um, and also serve as the air passageway. So the epiglottis is part of the larynx, so that's going to prevent food from entering our lower respiratory structure. So it's going to kind of reroute the food and air into their proper channels. Right. Um, the trachea or the windpipe um, is just an air passageway, so it's also going to help to clean, warm, moisten incoming air, and prevent um, anything from getting down into those deeper structures. Right. Bronchial tree uh, would be where the bronchi are going to branch and split off into smaller and smaller structures until we get to the bronchioles. Right. Um, alveoli are your main sites of gas exchange. So this would be where we start um, with the respiratory structures, respiratory zone structures. Um, so these are just the air sacs in the lungs um, where that gas exchange is going to occur with the blood. Um, so the lungs are going to um, house those respiratory passages smaller than the paired bronchi or the main bronchi. Um, and the pleurae are just the membranes, so serous membranes of the lungs. Right? So the parietal pleura lines the thoracic cavity wall. The visceral pleura covers those external lung surfaces.